And uh, we're going to have about 10 seconds of silence. All right, let's go ahead and begin the, the webcast. I, I'd like to introduce our host today, our presenter, Ed Scotus. Uh, he is not only a mentor to a ton of people in the InfoSec community and just in life itself, uh, he's a good friend of mine and a lot of us uh, who are on this webcast and whoever will meet him in the future. He's an amazing teacher and presenter. I don't know if you've ever done Net Wars, but uh, Ed has something to do with it, a lot to do with it. Uh, Cyber City, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, it's like a model train set that has the real ICS and SCADA systems that make a real city work and you can hack it. And the things that Ed comes up with is uh, extraordinary. He also authored a, a course called 560, which many of you have probably taken, 504. Uh, and he's also the guy that comes up with the holiday hack challenge each year. And this year is going to be absolutely amazing. He also looks a little like Heisenberg, if you've ever seen the TV show Breaking Bad. And uh, I don't know if you've ever had a selfie with him, but it could work as a Heisenberg replacement. Ed, would you like to start the webcast today? I think I would. Um, hey, it looks to me like there's this. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction, Jason. Seriously, I appreciate it. And I'd like to thank all of the folks here for joining us. I've got some really cool stuff to share with you. But before I get into that, Jason, I think you asked me to mention this HackFest thing, right? Yes, please. Ah, so there's this HackFest thing. What's the HackFest? It is, it's an event that SANS hosts every year um, where we throw everything we've got into this event to make it super special for you. It's going to happen November 2nd, 3rd. It's in Crystal City, Virginia, so it's like right by Washington, D.C., but you can get there from other places like Baltimore and so forth. I urge you to check this out. It is like the coolest thing we can make. Um, we have two days of a summit where we have some of the best speakers in the industry sharing some of their greatest ideas. Folks like Raphael Mudge, the guy who, who created Armitage and Cobalt Strike. Folks like Josh Wright, who's just one of the best hackers in the world. Uh, Tom Liston. It's an action-packed thing. Really, really cool. That's for two days. Then we've got uh, classes that follow it, six-day classes. But the real special thing about Hackfest is what we do in the evenings. Normally, at a Big Sands event, we do two nights of net wars. Now, this is not a Big Sands event. You'll get to know your instructors a lot more because the classes don't get quite as big as they do in, like, Sands Vegas, which is next week. So in the evenings, what we do is three nights of net wars. Normal Sands, two nights of net wars. We do three nights of net wars so you can apply what you're learning in class, hands-on in the evening, but with a lot of fun, some great music. We dim the lights. We have some beer. It's, it's a really, really good time. So three nights of net wars. We also do one night of Cyber City where you'll get a chance to save a city from terrorist attack. You'll be working through and manipulating the ICS infrastructure, the industrial control system infrastructure of the city to save it from attack. Really cool stuff. We're going to do some lightning talks. First time we've ever done that at a Hackfest. Little five, ten minute talks which are designed to give you a lot of information really quick. And then the final thing. We're working on this so hard. We're going to do a super secret special field trip. Um, we're in the final stages of planning right now, we got approval a week ago. I'm not going to tell you where it is, but it'll be the night of November 3rd. Buses will arrive at around 5 p.m., and they will take you to a place where our goal is to blow your mind. There's going to be a special little capture the flag thing. You'll work together as teams, so it's fun. It's networking. There'll be an ice cream sundae bar. My wife will be making cookies for it. See, I'm telling you, we throw everything we got into this thing. And uh, we're going to be going to a special place. Last year, we rented out the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum and did a capture the flag overlay of the museum itself. The year before, we uh, got the wonderful opportunity to host our event at the National Cryptologic Museum up by Fort Meade. So much fun. Um, anyway, this year, I think it's going to be better than both of those. So I hope you can join it. Please check it out. There's no URL on the screen, Jason. Wh where are they supposed to go to find out more about this? Do you know? Dance.org. Okay. Uh, slash hackfest. I just put it in the chat window in case anyone okay, gets thank you. Could you please do me a favor? Just look at this thing. It would make me happier if you at least just look at it. All right, but enough of this. Let's start this. So Jason and I were having a discussion about what we can do to, to help people learn. And, uh, you know, we do a lot of things like posters and, and, and stuff like that. Obviously, there's the classes. We, we try to do these YouTube videos and such. And Jason said to me, he said, you know, people really like these cheat sheets. Whenever we post a cheat sheet in Twitter, it gets retweeted a lot. People seem to click on it a lot. They seem to get a lot of value out of it. 
And I kind of like that. That's really cool. So then Jason started pushing me like every month or two saying, hey, let's do a new cheat sheet. Let's do a new cheat sheet. We even started polling on Twitter saying, what cheat sheet would you like to see next? And I think the last poll we did, people wanted a PowerShell one. So we, we took all the information about PowerShell that's in the 560 course and created a nice little cheat sheet out of that. So people seem to like the cheat sheets. I like the cheat sheets because it, it helps people learn. So, so students seem to like it. That makes me happy. I, as an instructor, like it because it's kind of a boiled down piece of information we can give to people. So that's all kind of good. This webcast, I, I, I got a confession to make about this webcast. This webcast is probably the most informationally dense webcast I've ever done. There's a lot in here because I'm going to show you through the cheat sheets and show you specific things in individual cheat sheets that are really useful techniques. So that's the good news I have for you, okay? There's a lot of information I'm about to go into. The bad news is this presentation is going to jump from topic to topic to topic as the cheat sheets do. We're going to look at like the Scapey cheat sheet, and we're going to look at the PowerShell cheat sheet, and we're going to look at the Metasploit cheat sheet. And it may seem disjointed because of that. See, often you'll have a, a webcast that's about one topic, and you know, you just talk about one topic. This is about the one topic of cheat sheets, but when we get into the cheat sheets, we're going to pull a whole bunch of disparate areas of focus. So if you feel like when we're going through one of the given cheat sheets, you're going to be like, uh, that one I didn't really make a lot of sense of, it, that's okay. I'm sure some of them, like I go through maybe the Nmap one, you're going to say, oh yeah, I knew that, that makes sense. But then maybe when I get to the Python one, you're going to say, oh, that's kind of outside of my area. That's okay, because you know, I have a solution to that dilemma. When I'm going through these individual cheat sheets telling you about some really cool points of it, if you say, I didn't really understand that one, you know what I have for you? I have a cheat sheet, <laughs> right? So there's a, there's, it's the cheat sheet itself that you could look at, and it will it will set you, set you straight and get you moving forward on that. So again, neat because this is informa informationally dense, very rich in a lot of topics and techniques for you, but it's going to seem a little disjointed. I confess that up front, but that's a good thing. All right, so with that introduction, let me give you the roadmap for this webcast. We'll start with, with why these cheat sheets. Why do we do them? How can you benefit from them? We'll then get into alternatives to cheat sheets. Cheat sheets are not the only thing in here that can serve the need here for you to have distilled, boiled down information that you can apply directly in your work. I'll talk about groups of cheat sheets that we have. I'll give you a sampling of choice cheat sheets. This is going to be the main focus of this presentation, sampling of choice cheat sheets. Then we'll get to the part where I beg you for input. So as I'm working through this, if you have questions, please just type the questions into the little question box. Uh, Jason Blanchard has the responsibility of taking your questions and holding them up until we get to the end, and then he'll, he'll ask me your individual questions. So if you have questions, please type them in. But just as important as those questions, if you have an idea for a cheat sheet, you'd be like, dude, if you made a cheat sheet that does this or that, I would love it. Let us know. Type it right into the box, and then Jason, when we get to the end, is going to tell me all the great ideas. And if there are none, I will just outright beg you for our input. Okay. And then we'll finish with conclusions. There you go. That's the webcast. Here you can see a few of the cheat sheets that I just kind of popped up on the screen here. Uh, PowerShell cheat sheet, uh, Python essentials cheat sheet. Uh, hanging off the screen a little bit here is the Scapey cheat sheet. We got a lot of them for you. All right, so moving to the next slide. Why cheat sheets? I've been brainstorming with my team here at CounterHack about cheat sheets and you know why they're useful and how they can be used. I mean, really thinking about this over the last week. One of the neat things about cheat sheets is it's bite-sized knowledge presented in a very condensed form. And, and a cool thing about the cheat sheet is it's focused on the most useful topics. They're put together by people who really know the given topic and they consider these things to be the most important. And it gives you a faster review than other sources. Now look, I love man pages. I'm all about man pages. Man pages are fantastic. That said, some of them get a little long, and sometimes you can't tell what's especially important from the man page versus the other options. Right? The man page will tell you, look, there's 20 command flags for this, and here they are, and here's you know, what they're used for. The neat thing about cheat sheets, though, that, that, that man pages often don't have is it can say, look, these are the most important topics. These are the most important use cases. That's pretty cool. Of course, cheat sheets provide a, a handy, quick reference. I mean, they're nice to have in paper format. For the various SANS classes, we do pass out cheat sheets when people take those classes live. Or if they take the classes on the internet via on-demand or, or vLive, we send them cheat sheets along with the book. I like to have the paper copies because you can kind of you can touch them. They'll open them up and touch. But there's electronic copies as well. 
and um, I will give you URLs to the electronic copies of every cheat sheet we'll discuss in this webcast. But now I've got for you what I think is one of the three most important. See these three bullets that are here? Learn, useful inspiration, source for memorization. Those, I think, are the three winners for the cheat sheets, okay? First, in putting this webcast together, I've been reading through the cheat sheets, some of which I worked on and some of which were worked on by other SANS pen test instructors. And I'm going through the cheat sheets and I'm like, dude, I didn't know that. Oh my gosh, look at this. This is a neat idea. So you can learn new stuff by reading them, even if you're an expert on this or that topic. If you know PowerShell or you know Netcat or you know Metasploit, I'd still encourage you to briefly read through the cheat sheet because, I mean, if you're like me, you're going to say, oh, that's a new idea. I'm going to use that. So you can learn new stuff by reading them. Also, a big win for these cheat sheets, they're useful inspiration for practice in the lab. I assume, I mean, you guys are all information security practitioners, so you probably have a lab that you've set up, certainly in the office, maybe at home, maybe on your laptop, it's all virtualized. And you might be saying, you know, I got a big trip coming up, maybe I'm flying out to uh, Vegas for SANS Vegas next week, or, or maybe you're on a train heading down to SANS Pentest Hackfest, uh, November 2nd through 9th. <laughs> Let's just say you're doing that. You've got some extra time with your laptop, um, pop open a cheat sheet and practice what's on the cheat sheet, right? That's kind of cool. And then one of the big things for me is a useful source of memorization. If you're going to use the given topic a lot, the cheat sheet can help launch you into memorizing quickly uh, the options that are available for you so that you can apply them very, very fast. These three, I think, are the really cool things. Learn, useful inspiration, source for memorization. They're also a refresher for stuff that you don't do often. This was mentioned to me when I was interviewing my team about how to use cheat sheets and, and what makes them useful for you. Daniel Pendolino from my team, he's actually listening right now in the secret room. Daniel said it's a refresher for stuff you don't do often, which is really cool. So the idea there is you're going to memorize the stuff that you do all the time. If you use Nmap or if you use Scapy every day, you're going to memorize that, right? But what if you don't do Metasploit every day? Or what if you don't do TCP dump every day? Well, there's no sense bothering memorizing that. Keep in your brain what you need to have readily accessible. Keep on the cheat sheet, the stuff that you can jump to when you need it. That's pretty cool. And then finally, let's face it, a lot of folks here take GEAC exams. And the GEAC exams, as you know, are open book. But those books are voluminous. You take a SANS class, you get like a 1,000 slides in books. That's fine. Creating an index, very helpful. But, you know, the cheat sheets are really nice, too. And you can bring the cheat sheets into the open book exam. And that's like condensed information, representative of what's in the class, but it's on one double-sided sheet of paper. It's not a 1,000 slides. So I think this is all kinds of winning stuff for why these cheat sheets are helpful. Now, let's talk briefly about the art of cheat sheet design. Believe it or not, we really sweat the details when we're putting together one of these cheat sheets. It's not just saying, let's copy and paste whatever's in the SANS class on Nmap and put it in here. It's not that at all. Instead, we want to include foundational ideas. You know, so if you're new to Nmap, here's the stuff you need to just kind of get up and running with it. But we also want to have advanced tips for people who might use it a lot, but they're like, oh, I, I didn't know you could do this. We try to have that balance so that you can get up and running with a given tool or idea or technique, but you can also do some advanced stuff, all based on the same cheat sheet. We also, when we're designing these things, try to put the most useful ideas near the top and near the front of the cheat sheet, so you can get to the most useful ones quicker. We also try to group similar ideas together, because our goal is, is to have a logical flow through the cheat sheet. Mm -hmm. we, we want you to be able to say, okay, here's how I would do this topic, and then my, I might follow up with that other topic, and I follow up with that third topic. We want them to flow. We also don't want it to be cluttered. We try to use white space carefully so that the cheat sheet isn't just a disastrous mess. I was putting this webcast together. I was looking at some of the cheat sheets that other people have created. Not InfoSec cheat sheets, but just general cheat sheets. And what I've noticed is a lot of them are really super cluttered. They're very dense, um, and they're kind of hard to read. I also noticed that a lot of folks make color cheat sheets. They're in full color. The ones that we do at SANS are in black and white, and our focus is on getting you really useful information in a fashion that is not super cluttered, but we do want it to have a fairly dense information content. Now, if you listen to everything I just said, I hope you realize these are contradictory goals. They are fighting with each other. You want the foundations, but you also want advanced stuff. 
you want the most useful ideas near the top and front, but I thought maybe the foundational stuff should be near top and front. You want to group similar ideas together, but you also want it to flow from idea to idea to idea. And there's an art to this. It's not a science. We try to make these things usable, interesting, fun, and to the extent that we can, we want them to be kind of good-looking cheat sheets. Um, so this is, these are all the considerations that go into laying out the information. It's not just the information. It's the layout and presentation of the information that's also important. Let's go to the next slide. All right, let's, let's talk alternatives to cheat sheets. We all love cheat sheets, right? I mean, that's why we're here. But there are some books that are available that are essentially collections of cheat sheets. Each of these books is wonderful. You are probably familiar with one or two of these books. I imagine several of you are not familiar with all three of them. The books I'm talking about here are the Red Team Field Manual, very nice acronym, RTFM, right? It's a fantastic book of red team things, uh, offensive things, pen testing things, if you want to call it that. Um, it's a really good book. It's available. You can buy it via Amazon. There is its companion, written by a different author. This is by Don Murdoch, um, the Blue Team Handbook, Instant Response Edition. Blue Team Handbook. Uh, is focused on helping blue do blue better. How can you find where you've been attacked? How can you find where the bad guy is in your midst? How can you respond appropriately to that? So you got the red side, you got the blue side, these are all very good. And most of you have probably heard of at least the RTFM, maybe the Blue Team Handbook is somewhat new to you. It's available on Amazon. I'll bet you a lot of you haven't heard of this third one here, and that is the Network Field Survival Guide. If you have heard of it, kudos to you, that's fantastic. But a lot of people I talk to have not heard of this one. This thing is amazing, holy cow! It's written by a guy named Jay McGurdy, and it's called The Way of the Packet. It sounds very kind of zen, right? Really cool. Um, you can go and learn more about what's in this network uh, field survival guide at thewayofthepacket.com, and it's a bunch of packet analysis stuff. It's really tremendous. Um, it's quite lengthy, but there's a bunch of cheat sheets in there. Some of them actually fold out because they're so big, so you, you kind of fold out the cheat sheet, and you can see all kinds of things in it. It's focused on packet stuff. So things like TCP, things like IP, things like TCP dump, things like a bunch of different tools you'd use, Netstat and so forth, all in this guide. It is self-published, but you can buy it on Amazon, and you will not be disappointed by this thing. Look, I make no money on this, right? I mean, Sans is vendor neutral. If I tell you about an interesting book, it's because it's actually an interesting book. And darn it, all three of these things are wonderful. All right. Oh, by the way, these little slides that I show you down here at the bottom, see the little screenshots down at the bottom of the screen? Those are from the way of the packet. It's in full color. It's lavishly illustrated. It's, it's pretty amazing. I think it's like $20. So uh, a lot of value for that $20 price tag. So that's an alternative to cheat sheets. You want another alternative? How about posters? As many of you know, maybe not all of you, but SANS publishes posters on a regular basis. We probably have five or six, maybe, maybe more posters go out per year. And uh, there are SANS pen test posters. There's DFIR posters for the digital forensics and incident response community. There's ICS posters, um, the industrial control system posters. There's all these different posters, and each curriculum within SANS releases about one a year, although Rob Lee is, uh, is very good with the posters. Often he'll have two a year that come out. Good for him. Um, many of these posters are listed at this URL that you see here, but I was going through it when I was putting this webcast together, and I noticed not all of the posters are included in that list. Um, you can download graphical images of the posters. So, I mean, they're big and they're very informationally dense. What the posters are is they're kind of like a collection of cheat sheets, quite honestly. But wouldn't it be cool if SANS would just send you these posters in the mail? Yes, SANS will. If you would like to register to receive the SANS posters via the Postal Service, so they're printed out in beautiful color, you can hang them up in your office, really, really nice. What you do is you log into your SANS portal account. And then within your SANS portal account, you go to sans.org slash account slash preference center. When you go into the preference center, you'll see it says update your e-newsletter subscriptions, information security topics of interest, etc., etc. Scroll all the way to the bottom of that, and you'll see postal mail preferences. And if you check that box there, that means I'd like to receive SANS brochures, and we bundle with the brochures the poster. These posters, they're really cool. Uh, SANS wants you to have this information. We'd love you to display it in your office. That makes us so proud. Whenever I walk into somebody's office, you know, I'm visiting customers or visiting friends. I'm looking around for SANS posters, and I, I, my heart jumps for joy when I see one. And my hope is that they hang it there, not just to cover up ugly walls, but, but they actually look at it, and it, it gives them some ideas and inspiration uh, for their work. That's my hope. 
Um, anyway, you can get these things. Uh, they're free of charge, but they're very valuable. Um, and uh, you just, with your SANS portal subscription, make sure you click, check the little box, please send me information security brochures, and see it says, and posters via the postal mail. All right, next, let's get into groupings of the SANS cheat sheets. Uh, there's a wonderful question that was asked uh, in the pre-webcast banter. Is there a single place I can go to for all of the SANS cheat sheets? And currently, there isn't. Jason Blanchard, though, I mean, just wonderfully volunteered to create just such a page for all of you. And uh, is it done yet, Jason? Oh, you don't have to answer now, but I'm sure he's feverishly working on it right now um, so that we'll have that for you. We don't yet, so that's why I have these lists of places you can go for different cheat sheets. And then for each individual cheat sheet I'm going to cover in just a couple of minutes, um, you will be able to uh, you know, download it from that specific URL. But if you want the SANS pen test cheat sheets, some of them, not all of them, are over at the pen-testing.sans.org website, resources slash downloads. So we have some of them there. For DFIR cheat sheets, we've got this uh, digital forensics microsite, we call it, digital-forensics.sans.org, and in there they have cheat sheets. And there's a third source of cheat sheets that come from SANS personnel, including um, Lenny Zeltzer. Lenny Zeltzer is a SANS instructor. He's a, a senior instructor, does great work. Uh, he wrote the reverse engineering malware course. He maintains the Remnix distribution. And Lenny is like a cheat sheet fiend. This man puts cheat sheets out about everything. And they're awesome. They're really, really good. If you go to Lenny's website, zeltzer.com slash cheat hyphen sheets, you will see there that he has a cheat sheet for reverse engineering malware. Well, of course, I mean, that's what Lenny's all, uh, Lenny's all about. He's got another cheat sheet on Remnix. That's his distribution for doing analysis of malware. He's got usage tips of Remnix. He's got tips for creating an InfoSec assessment report. He's got log review tips, all in a different cheat sheet. These are all different cheat sheets. He's got a security incident survey. So you've been hacked. What do you write down about how you've been hacked? What information do you have? And what information should you gather at the start of this incident? I'm telling you, my friends, Lenny Zeltzer has a cheat sheet for troubleshooting human communication. You should just read this cheat sheet because it's hilarious and wonderful and fun. And look, it could actually help you. The idea here is human-to-human -human communication sometimes can be difficult and sometimes can be flawed. And he, he has in here, he's got tips for like, did you show the proper amount of empathy when you were talking with that person? Did you ask them how they were doing? It's got the, the little banter stuff in there, but also it's got tips for optimizing the effectiveness and flow of human communication. When I read this cheat sheet, I read it as I was preparing for this cheat sheet thing, it looked to me like, you remember in um, Star Trek Next Generation, Commander Data? It looked to me like this was the algorithm in Commander Data's brain for interacting with all of the other characters in Star Trek. That's troubleshooting human communication. Anyway, really cool stuff. I put a, a little screenshot here of Lenny Zeltzer's IT and information security cheat sheets, and you can see what he's got in there. He's got one for getting the right IT job. Pretty cool. And then, of course, here's the Remnix one. Nice. All right. So with that said, and Jason, I hope you're getting the, recording the questions and ideas people are coming up with. It'd be really cool. With that said, let's move into some of the choice SANS pen test cheat sheets, ones that I think are invaluable. Um, we have the start here with the granddaddy of them all. This was one of the very first SANS cheat sheets. We keep it up to date. Um, this came out over a decade ago, and Johannes Ulrich from the SANS Internet Storm Center, he keeps this thing up to date. He just released a new version a couple months ago, and it's on TCP IP and TCP dump. See, it says here, version June 2016. This is fresh, my friends. Um, what, what does it have in it? It's got TCP dump usage. I use TCP dump on a regular basis, but sometimes I forget certain things in TCP dump. And this is one of my most favorite panels in the TCP dump usage. Right? I mean, if, if, you, if you forget, well, how do I display the link layer? Right? I mean, sometimes you want to look at the you know, source MAC address, destination MAC address. Oh, well, that's just dash XX, lowercase. Pretty cool. I'm usually pretty good at remembering dash R for read packets from a file or dash W to write packets for a file. But you know some of these other ones I don't remember all the time, and this gives them to me. And then he's also got handy acronyms. So when you're sitting on an airplane, you got nothing to do. Open this thing up and you say, hey, what is uh what does DF stand for? Oh, it's the don't fragment flag. And he's even got the RFCs that these things are found in, right? You probably know what HTTP stood for. But if we did include it, people that are new. 
might not know that. Uh, CWR, a little uh, congestion control information for you there, BGP, all these acronyms are quite helpful. But the best part of this TCP IP and TCP dump cheat sheet is not TCP dump usage and acronyms. It is that. Behold, look at that. That is awesome. Say you're sitting there in your lab and you've got some DNS weirdness happening and you want to look up you know, the DNS packet structure and uh, you could look it up on the internet, I suppose, but you have this handy cheat sheet. Just sit right there and here it shows you DNS and it's got the flags all in an easily digestible form sitting there. Now, most of the SANS cheat sheets I'm going over are trifold. This one is quadfold because um, there's just so much good information here. You want ICMP with all the message types? Here it is. Yes, you could look this up on the internet, but it's handy dandy right here. You could take it, print it out on paper format, and you got it. IPv4 is here. We've got TCP, some of the common TCP ports, all those control bits, very nice, um, and, and just really, really good stuff. I look at this, and I couldn't help but think, forgive me if you will, couldn't help but think, so much sexy. Just look at this. Fantastic. I'd like to thank the Internet Storm Center. I'd like to thank Johannes Ulrich for keeping this thing up to date because they're the people that make this one happen. We do distribute this one in several different SANS classes, including the SANS 503 class, which is on uh, incident analysis and packet analysis. We distribute it as part of the 560 class, which is on uh, pen testing and ethical hacking, uh, network pen testing. We distribute with a lot of the classes because it's just so darned useful. Cool. In fact, if you're going for a JAC exam that has technical stuff, I think you would be silly to not print out this cheat sheet and bring it in with you. I'm just saying, I'm not insisting, just a little suggestion. Next slide. All right, some other choice cheat sheets. The PowerShell cheat sheet. We released this one, it was a couple months ago, and it was based on a poll that uh, Jason Blanchard did uh, via Twitter saying, hey, here's some ideas for cheat sheets, which ones would you like most? And number one vote was PowerShell. Um, and what we did in this cheat sheet is we, we took some information that's included in the SANS Security 560 class, that's the network pen testing class, and one of the sections that, that we put in that class is if you're starting to learn PowerShell, here's five PowerShell essentials. In other words, if you had to memorize something to get you up and running in PowerShell, memorize these five things. The first one is get help, and a simply little alias is help, and then you give it the command let, and then dash examples. I love this. Folks, this is what I spend my time doing on airplanes these days. I pop up a PowerShell prompt, I do help, and then I give it a command let, dash examples, and it shows me examples of usage of different PowerShell commandlets. For example, there's a PowerShell commandlet for get child item. It also has an alias of ls, and I could do help ls dash examples, and it opens my eyes to new ways to use get child item. Really cool. So the, the help feature built into PowerShell, tremendous. You can also do get hyphen command. Get hyphen command will show you the commands that are available to you in PowerShell. You can do GCM, then you can do star, whatever string you want, star. So let's say you want to know all the PowerShell commandlets associated with process, right? I mean, how do I start processes, stop processes, kill processes? You do GCM, which is the same thing as get command, GCM star process star. Boom. Every commandlet that has the word process in its name is there for you. Get member will show you the properties and methods of these objects. Very nice. So you can run some commandlet, like ls or, or gcm or, 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 or ps, whatever it happens to be. Those are all aliases for, for various commandlets. Pipe that through gm, get member, and it'll show you the structure, the properties, the methods of those objects. Really neat. And then if you ever need to iterate over objects, you can use a for each object commandlet, which has an alias of the percent. And I, I recommend you memorize this because you run some commandlet, pipe that through, and then for each object, you can take action on that object. Dollar sign underscore is referring to the current object that's been passed down the pipeline. And the final thing in my recommended top five things to memorize to use PowerShell is select string. Because it's kind of like grep and will let you pull out patterns from the output of things. Really cool. So these are like five things that if, if I were advising you to say, you want to get into PowerShell, you got to memorize some stuff, memorize these five things. If you memorize these five things, all the rest of PowerShell will become easier to you. So that's for people who are kind of newer to PowerShell. But for those who have been doing some PowerShell stuff for a while, we've got some really cool use cases of PowerShell. On the right-hand side of the screen here, you can see PowerShell for pen tester post-exploitation. 
So say you hack into a box. You got a PowerShell prompt. Good for you. You want to do a ping sweep? You can do a ping sweep with the syntax that we show you right up here. 1.255 dot dot will iterate and just have the numbers 1 through 255 come out on the output. I'm going to pipe that through, various ping command, and select string to be able to do a ping sweep of a given target IP address range. Well, instead of a ping sweep, maybe you want to do a port scan. To do a port scan, I do a little variation of what you saw above, creating a new object called net.sockets.tcp client. Really cool. This is all built in. Is there a ping sweeper built into Windows? Sure, it's called PowerShell. Is there a port scanner built into Windows? Sure, it's called, it's called PowerShell. Is there a command line HTTP client in Windows? Yeah, it's called, well, there's a variety of them actually. You know, something like wget? In fact, all the way back to Windows 7, you can do a new hyphen object system.net.web client and then instruct it to download a file from a URL. That's just like wget. More recent versions of Windows have aliases for this, so if you're on like a Windows 10 box or a Windows 8 or 8.1 box, but we try to make the cheat sheets as widely applicable as possible. So we want to be able to pull in things all the way back to Windows 7. That's why we're using this syntax. If you want to search for files with a given name, we're using get child item here, that's alias to ls. If you want to figure out what hotfixes are installed in the box, look at that, get hyphen hotfix. So these are all useful things in post-exploitation, once you get shell in the box. Um, the other thing I love about PowerShell is the ability to navigate the registry right from the command line with tab autocomplete. My brain has, has a, a problem. <laughs> if you haven't determined it already, I don't know where you've been. But my brain, I'm focused on a specific problem here. My brain is unable to memorize registry key paths on Windows. I'm kind of embarrassed by it, but I can't. I can memorize command lines, I can memorize command flags, I can't memorize registry key paths. I don't know, they just don't stick in my brain. That's why I love the fact that I can navigate the Windows registry at a PowerShell prompt, it says psc colon backslash greater than, I can just cd hklm colon backslash. Hit enter, you have now navigated into your registry. You can type ls, it'll show you the various uh, paths in the registry that are available to you there. You can cd into them, it's got tab autocomplete, oh my gosh. Awesome. Next. All right, so that's PowerShell. The next cheat sheet I'd like to draw your attention to is Windows CMD.exe. I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, dude, that's old, right? CMD.exe, who wants to use that crap anymore? We have PowerShell now. I'm telling you, though, as a penetration tester, even as a security professional, CMD.exe still comes up. I use it a lot. I use PowerShell a lot. The shells actually kind of complement each other in very interesting and useful ways. Don't throw out cmd.exe yet. It's got some good stuff in it. Some things are much easier to do in PowerShell. A few things are much easier to do in cmd.exe. So that's why we have this cheat sheet for it. Some of the, another thing was mentioned last week um, when I was talking to my team about these cheat sheets. It was Daniel Pendolino, again, who mentioned it. Dan said, you know, hey, it's important to have the cmd.exe cheat sheet. And I said, well, why do you think that? And Dan said, PowerShell makes sense. I have a chance at figuring that out on my own. CMD.exe makes absolutely no sense, so a cheat sheet really helps out. And I'm like, dude, that's, really, that's brilliant. It's fantastic. So PowerShell, hey, you know, you can learn PowerShell by looking at our cheat sheet, but once you master it, it kind of makes sense. CMD.exe, you could learn that from our cheat sheet, but if it makes sense in your head, wow, you're very special. <laughs> So this makes a handy reference, though. And we include things like WMIC. I, I tried to boil this down to say, look, I want to tell you the grammar of WMIC and then give you specific use cases for WMIC and then how to make it take effect remotely. Some of you are saying, dude, what's WMIC? It's the Windows Management Instrumentation Command Line Tool. What does it give you access to? It essentially turns Windows into an object-oriented database that you can query and update. So you'll have objects like processes, or services, or the registry, or event logs. And you do WMIC, and then the specific alias you're interested in, like process, or share, or service, or NIC config. You then give it a where clause, where you're trying to find certain things with certain names and such. And then you give it a verb clause. That's what you want to do, like list, or get, or you might want to call a method, or delete something. This is pretty cool. I show you in the cheat sheet how you can do a WMIC, then say process, get slash question mark, and that will list all of the attributes of processes, including things like process ID, parent process ID, and more. Or if you want to list all callable methods, you do WMIC, process, call slash question mark. 
this will show you everything that you can take action on in a process or make a process do. And in fact, you can do this locally. WMIC process list full, that will run locally, show you all, all the attributes of all your running processes. But if you want to make it take effect remotely, we show you the syntax for that, slash node colon, slash user colon, slash password colon. It's all there. It's really cool. Also, the Windows CMD.exe cheat sheet also includes another very handy thing. I don't know if you've noticed, but Microsoft keeps moving around in the darn GUI where they have all of their configuration and management tools. And if you're like used to Windows 7 and then you move to Windows 8, heaven help you, or 8.1, which is a lot better, or Windows 10, where did they put this stupid GUI? I can't, I can't find it anymore. That's why I seldom launch Windows GUIs via the GUI, because they just keep moving. I launch them from the command line, though. Look, I do use the GUIs, the individual GUIs, but I launch them from the command line. So if I'm sitting at cmd.exe, and I want to bring up the local user manager, Microsoft Control, I just run lusrmgr.msc, and I've memorized this. I use it so often. If I just want to see the local users that are on the box in a GUI, you just type losermanager.msc. That's what it's called. It's called loser manager, L-U-S-R, loser manager. You want to see the services control panel? Just type services.msc. Boom, services control panel is on your screen. Task manager, yeah, you can hit control, alt, delete, and then you got to like click on this and point to that and stick your tongue out. Or you just type taskmanager.exe. Boom, it's there. You want to see the security policy manager, which shows you the security policy configuration. Type secpol.msc. Boom, you're there. You want to see your event logs? Eventviewer.msc. E-V-E-N-T-V-W-R.msc. You want to jump to your control panel without taking your fingers off the keyboard? Just type control. That's it. This makes my life in cmd.exe almost livable. Not quite, but almost. Anyway, these individual things. Most of these work from PowerShell as well. So there you go. And then one of the final real gems of cmd.exe is netstat. I know we look at netstat and say, oh, come on, that's a simple little tool. That's not a big deal. There's some stuff in Windows netstat that is awesome. Netstat-NAO will show you TCP and UDP port usage, and the O will give you the process ID that's using the port. If you throw a B on the end of that, it'll actually show you the process name that it's, that's communicating on that port. Here's another fact of Windows netstat. Netstat-NAO space give it an integer, and it will rerun netstat every n seconds, where n is your integer. That's pretty cool. So it just keeps displaying on the screen. And then you could pipe that through find looking for a port number, and it will let you monitor a given port every n seconds. Is there a connection to the port? Is that port listening? What's happening with that port? Pretty awesome. Mike Poore and I were doing a pen test years ago, and we were running a vulnerability scanner. And back in those days, the vulnerability scanner did not have very good status reporting on how far it was in the scan. So Mike was doing the scan, and I was on one of the target machines. And I wanted to see when Mike Poor's scan reached my target. Now, the scanner, of course, is going to do a lot of SMB stuff, which is on port 445. So what I did is I wanted to see when Mike's stuff got to me, because it was scanning thousands of machines. So I did a netstat-nao space 1, pipe through find, quote, colon 445, quote. So I'm looking for port 445. Pipe through find, quote, Mike Poor's IP address, quote, and I hit enter. And what it was doing is it was checking every one second to see if there was a connection to port 445 from Mike Poor's IP address. And at Mike Poor and I were just sitting on the phone talking, and I'm like, I got the command running, I'll just wait, I'll let you know. And then, you know, 15, 20 minutes later, I said, Mike, you're scanning me right now, I see it. And you say, well, Ed, you could get that via sniffer, like TCP dump. TCP dump's not built into Windows. I wanted something built into Windows that would tell me when Mike Poor started scanning me. Isn't that nice? Now, I had to know Mike Poor's IP address, but we were collaborating on this intranet scan. Also, when a lot of people think about Netstat, they think about TCP and UDP. Because, you know, Netstat is optimized for that, right? But did you know you can get ICMP statistics from Netstat? You could do a Netstat-S-P, so this means I want statistics of the protocol ICMP. And that will show you how many ICMP packets you've received, how many you've sent. It'll do it based on ICMP message type. That's really pretty cool. You can do this and follow it by a space and then an integer. You do netstat-s-p ICMP space 1. And every one second, it will show you your ICMP statistics. Nice. You could think of all kinds of clever uses for that. But let's move on. Let's talk about our Netcat cheat sheet. Our Netcat cheat sheet um, is available at the URL that I show you here. And we have some of the foundations of Netcat. Right? How do you create a backdoor shell with Netcat? Netcat, listen on local port, whatever port it is. When somebody connects, execute your shell, like bash, 
or if it's Windows, cmd.exe. You want to do a reverse shell? That's nice. We show you the syntax for a reverse shell. Very cool. NetCAD is often used for file transfer. So we show you how you could push a file or you could pull a file. These are the foundations of NetCAD. If you don't know these, you got to practice some time. Put some time aside in your lab and practice this. These are, these are the foundational building blocks of, of, of being able to attack and, and knowing what's happening on systems. But we also have some fancier stuff in our NetCat cheat sheet. So we got the foundations, but we also have these NetCat relays. For those of you that have taken 504 or 560 or some of the other SANS pen test classes, you're familiar with these relays. NetCat relays on Linux, we, we cover them on Windows, but we also cover them on Linux, where you can create a listener to client relay. The idea there is you've got a single box, maybe it's one that you've hacked into, and you want to pivot through that box, and there's NetCat on that Linux machine. What you can do is you can create a NetCat listener on some local port, whatever that NetCat listener receives, it'll pipe it into a NetCat client to shoot it out to another machine. So it's on this one compromised box, it's listening on one port, whatever data arrives, it shoots out to another machine on another port. That's very nice. Many of you are familiar with that. It's called a traditional NetCat relay. Yay! But the cheat sheet also covers some more interesting and complex relays. It covers a listener-to-listener -listener relay and a client-to-client -client relay. This is something I used in a pen test several years ago. I was thinking, I was on the situation where I had access to a DMZ Linux system. You see it on the right-hand side of the screen here? There was an intranet target that was listening on port 445. I was on the DMZ on this Linux box and I had shell. What I wanted to do is I wanted to run something on my outside pen test box that was an SMB client that would get access all the way through to this internal system. Now, here's the deal. There was a firewall configured in this environment, so I could make outbound connections from the DMZ, but I couldn't make inbound connections. So unless I disabled this firewall, I couldn't have like a traditional NetCat relay listening on TCP 445 and then forwarding it into TCP 445. That wouldn't work because I couldn't listen on 445 here. So instead, I created a listener-to-listener -listener relay on my own box. It would listen on port 445. Whatever data arrived on that, it would deliver to another listener on port 80. I had that thing just sitting there waiting. It's a listener-to-listener -listener relay on my own pen tester machine. Then on the DMZ system, which was a Linux box so it had NetCat built in, I created a client-to-client -client relay saying, hey, NetCat client, connect to my pen, test DMZ bo my pen test box not on the DMZ on port 80. And then I want you to connect that into another NetCat client that will shoot the data that it receives into TCP 445. Once this was set up, I then ran an SMB client program, whatever one you want to use, like SMB client, or even on Windows, you could do a net use to make an SMB connection. It shot through my own Linux machine, shot through the DMZ, I got access directly to the intranet. Now, this scenario requires, of course, that the DMZ machine be able to get to at least one intranet machine on TCP 445. Very useful, and I'm telling you there, it's right there. All the syntax you need for this is on that cheat sheet. Okay, it's on the NetCat cheat sheet. Cool. Next one, Metasploit. We got a Metasploit cheat sheet. I'm very happy with this one. I, th I think it came out really nice. Uh, some folks on my team put this together. In fact, <laughs> this is the Daniel Pendolino webcast, I suppose. Daniel Pendolino put the <laughs> Metasploit cheat sheet together for us. Dan's listening in the other room right now. Hi, Dan. Dan. Yeah. Hey, he said, hey, Ed. So, yeah, Dan, Dan put this one together for us. Thanks, Dan. Um, so Metasploit, what a great tool. There's so much it can do. It's free. You can also get commercial versions of it from the fine folks at Rapid7. I mean, really good stuff. Manage, what we try to include in here is stuff that confuses people a little bit so that we can kind of help them remember how to use it. Managing sessions, if you're not familiar with it in Metasploit, can get a, a little confusing. You know, what's the difference between exploit-z versus exploit-j? Right? We want to talk about that. Exploit-z says, hey, I want you to exploit this thing right now, and if a session comes in, put the session in the background. Whereas exploit-j says, I want this exploit to run, but I want it to run in the background. And of course, if there's a session with it, it may or may not be in the foreground or background. And you can use these together. You can do exploit-z, exploit-j, or exploit-jz or zj. So it's again, do you want the exploit to run in the background? That's dash j. Or do you want the sessions created by the exploit? to run in the background. That's dash Z. We also talk about job control if within Metasploit, like jobs dash L for listing them, jobs dash K for killing them. We've got a, a summary of wonderful meterpreter commands. We go over Metasploit framework Venom, 
which is the tool that is used to take a Metasploit payload and convert it into a standalone file, like a malicious payload that you might generate. We go through all the syntax on that. That's Metasploit. Next, we have an Nmap cheat sheet. Nmap's a great tool. A lot of people use it for all kinds of things. And uh, we cover the foundations within the cheat sheet. But also, one really handy part of this is target specification. So you're going to use Nmap to do a port scan or a ping sweep or something like that. How do you specify your targets? And we show you that you can do it as an IP address range, or you can do it as a CIDR block. Here we got slash 16. You can get an input list where you've got one range or IP address per line. You do dash IL for input list. One of the most useful things I find here, though, is this IPv6 reminder. When you're using Nmap with IPv6, you type in your IPv6 addresses, but then you need to do a percent sign and the interface you want your packets to go out. If you don't do this in Nmap, it doesn't work well. So this is a handy little reminder for that. We tell you how to specify target addresses and also target ports. And one of the most useful ones here is if you do a dash P dash, that means scan ports 1 through 65535. A lot of people that I talk to don't realize that the dash will do that. Some people who know that the dash will cause it to scan all ports don't realize that it doesn't include port 0. But the cheat sheet has that built into it. All right, cool. So that's Nmap cheat sheet. Some additional ones. Nmap scripting engine is phenomenal. So we have one of the panels on the cheat sheet, the categories of the different scripts. So Nmap can interact with target machines running off, uh, authentication scripts or broadcast scripts. We show you uh, some notable scripts, like uh, essentially some examples. There's an Nmap script called DNS zone transfer .nse. What you could do is you could use Nmap with the syntax I show you here, and you could have it scan an entire intranet. You just give it the hosts for TCP port 53, because remember that's where zone transfers happen. And then you run the script wherever you find that port open, and you try to do a zone transfer for a given domain. So that allows you to do zone transfers from all of your DNS servers, maybe over one evening, on your intranet. And you can look through that and see what interesting stuff is there. And this is just one example of some of the notable scripts we include in the cheat sheet. Great for practicing. Next cheat sheet is the Scapy cheat sheet. Scapy cheat sheet we released uh, in April of this year. And we cover the basics of Scapy. For, if you're not familiar with Scapy, it is a fantastic packet generation and analysis suite that runs in Python, but you don't have to know Python to still make Scapy do incredible things. Scapy can craft packets, it can sniff packets, it can receive packets. It's amazing. We give you the Scapy basics, like LS to show you a list of supported protocols, or LSC to show you Scapy commands. We show you how to get help on each of those commands, and then we show you how to craft basic packets, right? I mean, that's, that's what you need. We also get into some more advanced stuff. We get into different ways to send packets and sending them at layer three and higher or layer two and higher. We talk about how to receive packets. Scapy can sniff. We tell you how to sniff, how to read PCAPs, how to write PCAPs. It's all there. It's all there in a handy cheat sheet format. Sweet. And then our final spotlight on the cheat sheets is the Python cheat sheet. This one was written by Mark Baggett. I've been doing a lot of Python development myself over the last nine months as I automate things in my office, and Python is a blast. What a great, great environment. SANS has a class uh, that is called uh, pen testing, uh, or Python for pen testers, SANS Security 573, and they cover all kinds of great Python tricks, and some of the best ones are included on this cheat sheet that Mark created. It's got three methods of Python execution, so you can invoke Python with a dash C and then just give it your script as a string, or you can just run Python as an interpreter and then give it the name of the file that contains your, your particular script. But when I'm doing Python development, I almost always do it interactively so I can make sure the stuff is working. So you just invoke Python. You can print hello world. It prints hello world. When I'm trying to control the lights or the shades or the uh, Mesmer tube or whatever in my office, all this crazy technology, I'm doing it via interactive Python to figure out how it works. And then I make it into a script and I usually invoke it via the Python um, interpreter. Also, I always screw up these string, string operations, so I've got this cheat sheet handy now, and I can just look and see all these different uh, things that I can call on the strings. And loops and lists. If you're not super familiar with Python's looping and listing structure, this part of this cheat sheet is super helpful. I'll tell you how to create an empty list, assign values to an index. There's a whole bunch of stuff in here about dictionaries as well. If you're going to learn Python, 
you might want to start consulting this cheat sheet from the very start. It will help you. Uh, if you already know Python, you might want to look through this. I was just, as I was preparing for this webcast, I started looking through this and I'm like, oh, that's a much more convenient way to do this thing in Python than the messed up way I've been doing it for the last six months. Really cool stuff. All right, there's one more thing I'd like to cover that's not really a cheat sheet, but it's kind of like a cheat sheet. It was released by Josh Wright, and it's available on GitHub. It is a mobile app report card so that you can go through, and it tells you how you can assign letter grades to each aspect of a mobile application. Like, say, say you're in an enterprise, and they're thinking, hey, maybe we, should, uh, maybe we should use this mobile app and push it onto all of our devices. You've been assigned the task of testing that mobile app to see if it's secure. So Josh Wright walks you through for iOS apps, or there's another one for Android apps. He walks you through the individual tests that you should do. You assign it a grade for the individual test, whether it passes that or not. And then Josh, based on his formula, will calculate for you an overall letter grade. And here's the actual letter grades he's given to some applications that are available today. Zillow, got a D. Lovely. All right, here we have Uvu. Ah, they're a little better. They got a C minus. Anyway, you, these are just the two sample ones that Josh Wright put together. You can create your own based on whether you have the skills to do this kind of analysis. But this is pretty cool stuff. It is a, it's kind of like a checklist, kind of like a reminder of what you need to do to evaluate whether the application is any good. Does the app validate TLS certificates? Some of them don't. Does it use certificate pinning? Some of them don't, et cetera, et cetera. It's all there for you. And then I have some ideas, just really briefly, for you to use the cheat sheets. Here's one I already mentioned. For your next airplane flight, bring a cheat sheet and your laptop and practice. Practice, practice, practice. You can also keep multiple sheets in a designated cheat sheet folder. I've seen many students have this. So they got it open, they can just flip through it real quickly. You can also keep them on your computer's desktop for handy opening. They're, they're in PDF form. So you just open it up uh, on your desktop and start looking around on it. You can do searches and all that kind of stuff. But this last one, I love this idea. This was Jason Blanchard's idea. I've got to give him credit. And that is, when SANS distributes the cheat sheets to you, they're all in black and white. But for handy reference, you could put them on colored paper. So, for example, you could put your PowerShell cheat sheet, maybe put that on blue. Why? Because PowerShell, the prompt by default, is white on a blue background. So PowerShell, so then you just think about that, and you're like, oh, pick up the blue one. It's easy to find. That's the PowerShell one. Or how about yellow? I've made the scapey one yellow. How, how do I remember that one, scapey? Because scapey has P in it. See, scapey, and it's yellow. Yeah. Look, whatever helps you remember it, OK? The Python one is in green. Why? Because Python is a snake. Snakes are green. Well, not all snakes are green. But some snakes are green, and that helps me remember that. OK? So you could do the colors. Now, you're probably sitting there saying, dude, when you hand them out at SANS events, why don't you just put them in color? I asked SANS if they could do that, and they said logistically it would be really, really difficult to get the book bags built and to build them right with individual colored paper. But you can download all these cheat sheets at the URL I've shown you, all these URLs that I've shown you, and you could print them in color yourself, and I think that would be pretty cool. Also, Jason Blanchard himself, every once in a while, will show up at a security event like a B-Sides event or ShmooCon with color printed uh, versions of the cheat sheets. All right, so ideas for new cheat sheets. I'm going to tell you what I'm thinking about, and I'm hoping you're already giving me ideas for new ones. This is the part where I beg you to help me do my job. Thank you very much. Um, I'm thinking, should we do maybe an, o an overall pen test methodology cheat sheet? You know, like uh, scoping, reconnaissance, scanning, exploitation, post-exploitation. That, that might be a good cheat sheet. I don't know. What would help you do your job better? I do think we should have some web app pen testing cheat sheets. Um, I've talked to Eric Conrad and Seth Meisner. So has uh, Jason Blanchard. Uh, and they are working on some. We're expecting them first quarter of 2017. Maybe one on cross-site scripting, maybe one on SQL injection, maybe one on burp. Wireless cheat sheets, would that help you? Would that help you do your job better? Let us know. Josh Wright would create one, I'm sure. Maybe Larry Pesci would help. Mobile, uh, what should it be in mobile? Mobile pen testing, mobile application, now? What, what do you want in mobile? Social engineering, is that useful for you? Let us know. We can continue to guess. We can continue to put stuff on Twitter, like polls and such, but you have an opportunity here to tell me what we can do to help you. So please share your ideas. I hope you're typing some in now that Jason is uh, fiendishly harvesting. And now we move to the next slide. I'm, I'm, I'm loving these cheat sheets, and I'm hoping that they are helping you. And we want to make more, and to make them more valuable, more accessible, and more useful to you. At a bare minimum, I hope they help you with your GIAC exams. 
and if look if you're not going for GX certification, um, I still hope that they can help you in getting new ideas of new techniques, new tricks, new tools that you can use, and they can get you moving faster in those tools. But I am here to ask you for your help, and I'm here also to offer my thanks to you for not only attending this webcast, uh, but also if you have some ideas uh, on cheat sheets and how we can make them more useful and better for you. We'd appreciate that. And before we open it up for questions and answers, I did want to remind you that we've got this thing called the SANS Pentest Hackfest. It's coming up November 2nd through 3rd. That's a two-day summit followed by November 4th through 9th, six days of training. It's going to be so cool. It's going to include everything from a night of cyber city missions to a super secret field trip, three nights of net wars. You can earn coins, pen test coins, these challenge coins, for you, you demonstrating some amazing uh, technical capability in net wars. My wife is going to bake cookies. Um, it's everything that we can put in there for you. And it's going to be so much darn fun. Please do check it out. You can go to sans.org slash hackfest, I believe is the URL Jason said. Hey, Jason, you want to do a little Q&A thing here? You ready for that? Yeah, Ed. Uh, let's see. We got a, just a few minutes here. Yep. Uh, the one we can question, go a little bit long if you want. We can go like five minutes after if you want. It's totally up to you, right? Okay. Whatever. Yep. I said the one I really wanted to get to is uh, since I've read opinions that Netcat is antiquated and newer, better tools should be utilized. Any validity to that? A couple thoughts on that. First, uh, there are tools like NCAT. NCAT was, it's N-C-A-T, it was released by the um, NMAP project several years ago. It's wonderful. It's got built-in SSL and a bunch of other useful features that are not in NETCAT. But here's why I think what you heard about NETCAT was wrong. NCAT is great, but it's not built into most Linuxes. Most Linuxes that you get right off the shelf have NETCAT, the standard NETCAT in them. That's why you still need to know NETCAT. Now, also, another in interesting point. If you go back 10 years ago, most antivirus tools did not have signatures for NETCAT. But if you go back five years ago, most antivirus tools did have signatures for NETCAT. But today, it's hit and miss. They've, they've dropped some of the NETCAT signatures for antivirus tools. Some of them have it, some of them don't. So that's kind of cool. Some of the more recent tools, though, the antivirus vendors have signatures for them. So NETCAT, because of its age, sometimes they've aged out the signatures for it in antivirus. So I still think it's vital to know how to use NETCAT. The other thing, another guy on my team, his name is Tom Hessman. He wrote a cheat sheet that compares NETCAT and NCAT. So you can see the different features of each one of them. I didn't include it in this presentation, but he wrote this several years ago, and it's really a wonderful thing. It was when NCAT first came out. If you do a Google search for Hessman, H-E-S-S-M-A-N, NCAT versus NETCAT, it'll probably be your first hit. So NETCAT is still vital. We use it all the time in our pen testing. I talk to Josh Wright all the time. He talks about how he uses NETCAT. It's just there. It's part of the environment on Linux, whereas NCAT usually isn't. All right, next question, please. Great question, though. Thank you. All right, uh, Ed, the other question was, um, got it all queued up here. Good. Said, uh, or maybe I didn't have it queued up. Ed, I am terrible at this. <laughs> okay. so, I called so, Jason this morning at 9 a.m. saying, hey, Jason, will you do Q&A? <laughs> well, there's been some uh, great suggestions that have come in. Uh, one is, are there any good publicly available templates we can use to make our own cheat sheets from Brandon? I would be happy to send you the SANS one. It's in PowerPoint. Uh, and no, I'm not trying to hack you. I won't include a macro in it or anything like that. But I could send you the SANS one. I'm going to take the SANS logo off of it, though, because, you know, I mean, SANS should be the one generating SANS cheat sheets. But I can send you the format, just take the SANS logo off, and then you could use that. I, I'd be honored to share that with you. And here's the deal. If you want to create a cheat sheet that SANS should consider for distributing, we'll give you all credit. We will make you as much of a rock star as we can for having created such a great cheat sheet. Send, I'll, I'll send you the template. You send me the cheat sheet, and we'll look through it. I'll have my team look through it. We might tweak it a little bit, move things around. Make sure you get all credit, though. Um, maybe we'll publish that. It would be wonderful. You know, you could help the community. So email me. My email address is ed at counterhack.com, and uh, I will send you the template if you'd like. And if you, have, um, if you create a, a cheat sheet that you'd like us to point people to, now, you know, I can't promise you we're going to point it people to it if, if it's not very good. <laughs> but if it's good, um, we'd be happy to point people to it and give you full credit. So email me if you would like a template. 
Uh, Ed, uh, it appears we do need to leave at the top of the hour, but uh, I wanted to say that we got about 40 suggestions for cheat sheets that are just fantastic. Awesome! Yay! Thank you. Can you give me three of the best? Uh, the best one's uh, Wireshark. Nice. Uh, SQL Injection. Nice. Love it. And then just a basic one on pen test methodology for people who are just beginning in pen testing. I love that. And then maybe we could do a companion of it that's advanced. That would be really neat. And then before we leave, uh, there's a Twitter contest that is launching today. Ed, could you talk about it for just a second? Oh, yes. So I mentioned this pen test hack fest thing, right? November 2nd and 3rd is the two-day thing. We're doing a Twitter contest where we're going to give away a free seat at the two-day summit. It's in Washington, D.C. Well, it's in Crystal City, right outside of Washington. All you need to do is take a picture of yourself with a SANS pen test coin or maybe a SANS pen test brochure or SANS, any, any sort of SANS swag. Even if you don't have any SANS swag, you, with your computer screen displaying the SANS logo, tweet that and make sure you mention um, the, it, it's the hashtag Hackfest. Is that right, Jason? Or is it SANS Hackfest? Do you have that yeah. handy? Yep. Yeah. yep. Uh, so mention Hackfest and mention at SANS pen test. That's how we'll find them. So at sans pen test, sans pen test, and then pound sign hashtag um, uh, hackfest. We'll find them, and then we're going to draw at random. We're going to draw at random uh, someone who's going to be able to attend the summit for free. The other option you have is instead of taking a picture of yourself, you could, if you've come to one of the previous hackfests, share your favorite hackfest memory via Twitter. So, so, and, and we're going to launch this today. We're going to run the contest for about a week or so. Um, and uh, we're posting the details. Jason, do you have a URL where they can get those details? Uh, if they follow us on Twitter, and it will be at the Sans Pentest blog. Sans Pentest blog. Got it. Got it. Cool. Very good. Um, all right. Well, let's go ahead and close this thing out. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for showing up. But Jason, I think you'll, you'll do formal closing duties. Is that right? Uh, uh, Carol said that she would. So Carol. Oh, Carol. Uh, all right. Ladies and gentlemen. Carol. Hello. Yay, Carol. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ed and Jason, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, you can visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.